go ahead and start the recorder now. Um, starting it a bit late, but um, we've just kind of finished up our thank yous. So uh, just a quick reminder about the SakaiCon photo contest. So if you wanted to contribute a photo, you can either post to Instagram or Twitter with the hashtag SakaiCon2020, or there's a post to social wall link in the conference site. Um, and you can also submit a photo there without having to share on social media. So if you're not on Instagram, you're not on Twitter, don't want to post to Twitter for whatever reason, um, you can post directly to the social wall to um, to contribute a photo and let's just take a quick preview see what's out there now I know some folks have posted so um, we don't have a whole lot of photos yet there we go there's Laura I know she posted a few in the last couple of days um, so right now she's the one to beat um, she's the the best uh, Sakai Sakai gear photo at the moment. We've got a few more coming with um, stuffed Sakaigers. There's one of me with my mug and my original shirt from the first year we did the virtual conference. Um, and I think there were a couple more that I remembered seeing. Yep, some people got their uh, their mugs and have posted. So um, thanks to those who have participated so far. And if you haven't, please do. Um, we're gonna have to cut this off probably around one o'clock. We'll look to see what's, uh, what's posted so far. And oh, look, there's Christina with her mask. Um, so, um, so hopefully you can get those photos in uh, to be considered for prizes because we are giving away prizes for, for the best photos. So um, without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our speakers for the Pedagogy and Privacy in a Pandemic keynote session. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, Laura Gibbs and, um, and Chuck Severance. Laura Gibbs is a longtime online instructor at the University of Oklahoma teaching general education humanities courses. She's the author of Aesop's Fables, a new translation, Oxford World's Classics, and the Tiny Tales book series. Um, Dr. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry about that. My do dog decided to start barking. Um, Dr. Chuck needs no in introduction. Um, he is uh, kind of our, our uh, our lead person here for the Sakai project. He's a um, clinical professor at the our School of Information at the University of Michigan and the chair of the Sakai PMC. Um, so let me go ahead and turn it over to them. And um, let me, I'll stop sharing my screen, Dr. Chuck, so that you can share yours. And I believe they're doing a, a Simulive um, style uh, presentation where they have a recorded presentation and both of them will be in the chat to answer questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see the presentation? Yes, I can. Now the question is, will you be able to hear the presentation? Oh, wait, hang on. I got to share it the right way. Share screen, share computer sound, optimize share for video clip. Now I think you'll actually hear it. Yep. So, um, so, so stay in and say something if you don't hear music now that I press play. So hello everybody and welcome to the 2020 Sakai Virtual Conference. Um, I'd like to welcome Laura Gibbs to our conference. And uh, Laura, go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, I'm an online instructor at the University of Oklahoma and I've been teaching online for about 20 years now. Well, great. So there's a couple of things that we want to cover. Um, first, you are a great teacher and have some really interesting pedagogies. Uh, we're going to want to cover privacy. Um, we're just we're going to want to cover some of the things that have happened in your teaching as a result of COVID. Um, but let's start with privacy. Um, I know for me, privacy has become a recent phenomenon that I'm very excited about. What is it that got you going on Twitter on, about privacy? Well, what happened to me was my school is using Instructure Canvas. And so when I found out about the digital analytics that they were doing, the predictive algorithms that they wanted to create, I was pretty upset because 
I really didn't want my work or my students' work to be part of that commercialization of their data. You know, so it wasn't about the data being out in the open, exposed or hacked or sold. It was just about what Instructure was doing with that data. And I'd honestly never really thought about that as a problem. I've been using the LMS, like I said, for about 20 years. And I always thought of it just in terms of, I use the LMS for what it's good for, and then the semester is over and it's done. And I was just really naive about uh, how the accumulation of data, especially for a company like Instructure, could become something of commercial value to them. So, so Instructure announced they were going to do this right before they were they went private, and then they announced they weren't going to do that. And it's my, they announced that they're going to do it again. If do, do, is that how you see it? I, you know, I think what we learned from that, which was really fascinating, is that they had that brief interlude where they were a publicly held company, and we learned about these analytics projects from the CEO in an investor's call, right? So it brought about, strangely enough, the fact that they were um, uh, uh, accountable, in a sense, to their investors, that we learned some things that I don't think we would have learned otherwise. And it's also the case that that CEO was someone who talked a lot. He didn't actually, I don't think, know a lot about education, but he certainly had ideas he wanted to share. And so we got to hear from them some things that I think normally we wouldn't hear. Well, now, Instructure is privately held. Uh, the, that CEO is gone. And so I think without some kind of proactive privacy statement, we have to continue to be worried about what's going to happen to the students' data. They haven't given us a way yet uh, to get our data removed from their databases. They've said they're working on that, you know, and in response to a lot of community pushback about what had happened with those data analytics, they did start a privacy process. They've hired a privacy officer. They didn't have that before, but I think we still have a long way to go. Yeah, for, for me, it really came down to not so much a specific moment, although the talk of artificial intelligence and machine learning and big data applied to student records is, is not surprising because it might be attractive to investors. And so it's like, ooh, artificial intelligence, let's give this company money. But for me, I, I was er worried earlier, just the notion that from 1997 until 2015, every single student record was on a computer and disk drive that I physically knew where that was at, right? It was, mm -hmm. it was in a building, it was on our campus. And when we went to Canvas and Structure, the data wasn't there anymore. And I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. And I've, my fear was not that the immediate next day it would be stolen or lost or what it compromised. My fear was is 10 years later, over a series of management changes, that it would just like something would happen. And we're like, you know, we're not very happy about that. And but it's too bad. It's too late. The the horse has left the barn. And so my my worry is just in general, the fact that we even have to wonder if Canvas is making these kind of decisions or if they're going to change their mind, they're going to do one thing and then they're going to do another thing. I mean, like, I don't even want to be connected to that risk that they might change their mind, that we're only going to be private if they, you know, our data is only going to be protective if they feel like protecting our data. So. And the, the concept that I think really comes into play there is this idea of purpose limitation. You know, I can understand for legal archival reasons, student data after course is over might be something you would need to keep. But honestly, I'm really not sure that you would need to keep it for very long. You know, that's just not something that, that schools ever needed to do. There was no real viable option for, you know, saving every shred of data about students and, you know, giant filing cabinets in the admissions and records office. But now, you know, the cloud has suddenly made that possible. But as I see it, you know, the purpose of the LMS is to help us do our jobs as teachers, it's also to help the people in the missions and records with enrollment. But once a class is over, well, what is the purpose of keeping that data available at all? And it seems to me it would be quite easy to invent a system where, you know, you let the students export their data so they would have a copy of it if they needed to appeal something. But I really don't see that anybody, much less an LMS vendor, needs our students' data 
after the class is over. That's my personal take on it. And that's the kind of conversation from the perspective of an instructor I'd like to see us having. So, so given that you, like me, don't exactly trust your LMS vendor, because it's a you know cloud outsourced hosted vendor. Do you teach differently to protect your students' uh, privacy, even in given that you're forced to use that LMS? Well, and here's what's really interesting, and in and it's a different privacy question. But the tension I face, and I've always faced as a teacher, is I don't want my students to be isolated, even though they're taking an online course, right? So that you know, the easiest way to protect someone's privacy is to lock everything down, shut it all away, and limit access to things. But I teach in a very connected way. Connected learning is kind of the the mantra, the label for what I do. So I've always had to use tools beyond the LMS so that my students could connect with each other and communicate and share. And I definitely believe in the idea that you know learning online can be highly social with all kinds of digital stuff that we're creating and sharing in that online space but the key for me has been to let the students make choices about those tools and to let the students configure those spaces and so I've taken on that burden with the tools the array of tools that we use in my classes and those same ideas I think should apply to the LMS you know students should be able to export their data from the LMS, all the contributions they make to the discussion board, for example, the same way that when they use blogs in my classes, they can download a local copy of the blog. If they decide to delete the blog at the end of the semester, they've got a copy. You know, so all the principles that I've had to work on with other tools, I would like to see those apply to the LMS as well. Um, with uh, more protections for students who want to use pseudonyms, for example, in specific courses. Instructor does a cool thing right now where you can change your display name, but you have to change it system wide. You know, you can't decide, well, in this class, I'm perfectly happy to use my name, but in another class, I prefer to use a pseudonym. So anyway, there's a there are lots of options, right? There aren't technological limitations to doing the right thing here. It's more just a need for, for dialogue and, and ideas and finding good solutions. So uh, with the COVID, a lot of a lot of people have decided that uh, the thing they need is a bunch of high stakes exams and a bunch of really good surveillance and uh, and cameras and all that stuff. What is that? Is that what are your thoughts on how that uh, how that's going? Well, you know what I think about that once again, you know, it's I've struggled with this as an instructor all along, you know, how are you going to make an assessment meaningful? How are you going to make assessment useful? And so this is a great coincidence. But just this week, a book that I contributed to called Ungrading has just come out from West Virginia University Press. I've got a chapter in there and I think there are about 15 contributors from higher ed and K through 12 talking about all the different alternatives we can use to high stakes exams. And there are so many different kinds of options. And so I was really glad that the book came out now. It was supposed to come out in December and they pushed to get it to come out a little early, I think, because everyone realizes COVID has given us an opportunity and even an imperative to think again, to rethink what we're doing with, with grading and with exams. Um, the kind of surveillance that's going on with the uh, Procter and Companies. And also, you know, to be honest, I shared with you um, last week something that I saw coming out of Canvas, the official Canvas Twitter stream, a new kind of approach to plagiarism prevention, they called it, that's based on big data and AI and ML and, and using our students' data in ways that I think the students would be pretty appalled if they knew that was how it's being used. So we've got a lot to watch out for in COVID and beyond, right? But my colleagues who want to use, you know, high stakes video surveillance camera based exams, they're like, oh, but the students will cheat. Oh, what, what, what's your, you're an ungrade, if you, as an advocate of ungrading, I mean, doesn't ungrading equal instant cheating? And well, it, it doesn't equal instant cheating at all. It's a solution to get around cheating. And I, you know, we've just got a few minutes here, but I've, I put my chapter from that book online for anybody to read. That's at grading.mythfolklore.net. And like I said, the book has all kinds of excellent contributions from people, not just in humanities like me, but computer science and STEM, people who really do wrestle with work that isn't weird, right? My solution to cheating is having the students do work that's so weird, they're not going to be able to 
Google it, you know, no matter how hard they try, they're going to have to write it themselves. But for people who are teaching computer programming like you do or STEM classes where, you know, there are some assessments that are not totally out there, weird, subjective, uh, ungrading offers lots of possibilities, none of which involve surveillance or big data. Yeah, for me, what I, I, I basically assume that uh, I don't like to even use the word cheating. I use the word collaboration. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I figure is that we as faculty, if if we create an assessment and the rational behavior of the student is to cheat on that assessment, then to some degree we've constructed a bad assessment. And when we have students locked in a room for two hours on campus and we can ensure their security and give them a, a an assessment that really maybe doesn't even really measure the learning objectives of the class, but it's the assessment that they can give and have given that is sort of this, it's, it's like, it's like mean. It's like, you're going to come in, I'm going to give you a mean exam and you better darn well study and you better darn well listen to my stuff and you better darn well homework because otherwise mean bad things are going to happen to you in this room Friday from two o'clock to three o'clock. The only way for you to survive this mean experience is harsh experience is to study and a teacher once told me that you know before you learn most everything before the exam starts and so it, it almost doesn't matter if your model is the exam is a mean brutal difficult moment and the pain of that motivates the learning before you know up up to that point and it almost doesn't matter what the exam is as long as it's like mean well, thoughts on that? well, and here's the thing about mean exams and, and getting people to study. People need help learning how to study, right? Like I teach writing, you know, students need help all along the way. And so I call my approach all feedback, no grade. So I skip the mean thing at the end because I figure if I give the students lots of feedback and lots of opportunities to uh, rework their work, to improve it, to revise it, to learn from their mistakes, then by the time we get to the end, we're done. We don't need an assessment because they've worked hard all 15 weeks on improving their work and they've all gotten better. And I would say if you look through the ungrading book, that's one of the major recurring themes is how do we do not that summative assessment at the end. We may need to do it. We may not. That varies from program to program. But you do need formative assessment, right? You need a way to find out what your students are doing, what they know, what they don't know, so that you can intervene early and there if they cheat everybody's in trouble you can't give them the correct feedback that they actually need if they haven't shown you what they're actually able to do and so that's why getting grades off the table and just focusing on feedback is fantastic because then the students aren't afraid to show you what they know or what they don't know they may not like finding out that you know they have all these things that they need to work on, but at the same time, if there's not a penalty for that, if they're not being punished for it, that's where the learning happens. Um, so as a teacher of writing, obviously formative feedback is really important, but that happens in any kind of learning. You know, It's not just about whether the student got a question right or wrong on a quiz, it's about why they got that question right or wrong. And you need to have some dialogue with the students to find out what that's all about. Did they not understand the reading? Did they not do the reading? Can they not afford the textbook? You know, what's going on? A quiz is not going to give you the answers to those questions. So, so do you have, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that because you're pretty, pretty popular on Twitter that people ask you for guidance and mentorship. Um, as the COVID thing kind of came down and like we all went online, do you have any stories of people that you're like, oh, they got it and they did a good thing. And they, as I, I, Laura, helped them go online and they kind of saw this light and uh, anything you could share like of, of some kind of happy growth moments that were caused by COVID. Yeah, you're making me smile, which is good because in the, the era of- I don't know the answer to the, by the way, I don't know the answer to the question. I was asking it and hoping you had an answer. Oh, and I do have an answer because something great did happen, which was, you know, back in the spring when all of this came down, I thought, well, what is the contribution that I can make? It's like, 
I can teach everybody to blog, right, and how to build a blog network for their classes so that you're interacting with the students through their blogs and they're interacting with each other because that's what I do and, and I love it. It works great. Well, of course, not everybody wants to learn to blog, but a few people did work through the these workshop materials that I put up and they're still online. They're all at summer2020.lorgibbs.net. And what was exciting for me was that people at totally different schools, people I've never met in person, people in very different disciplines, disciplines from criminology to physical anthropology, they were able to take blogs and use that in their classes so that they could feel connected to their students and their students could feel connected to each other in the midst of this sudden, oh my God, I'm online, how did that happen moment. Um, so that felt really good because you always wonder, you know, are the strange things I do with these work for other people? So it was great to find out that it could work for other people. So in my own teaching, there, there are things uh, that I sort of was forced to start doing. Well, not forced, but the, it became easier to, it be, the easy path changed how I teach uh, my on-campus classes. And I, I don't know if I'll be able to keep it, but I wanna keep, I wanna keep, after COVID's gone and we can be together, I wanna change how I teach. I don't know if I'll get away with it, but we'll see. And let me tell you what I'm thinking of doing. So what I've realized is, is giving lectures in the time, in a, when we're same place, same time, which now all of a sudden is precious and not available. When we're same place, same time, um, I don't want to give PowerPoint slides anymore. And, and that seems like everyone would say that's don't do PowerPoint, but a lot of my stuff is still PowerPoint because there's lots of content and there's not, I think there's nothing wrong with PowerPoint. But I find that what I'm gonna do same place, same time in the future is really much more like um, coaching, much mm -hmm. more like this is what we're doing this week. This is my learning objective for the week. You might find problems here. On Tuesday, this is gonna happen. On Wednesday, this is gonna happen, but you're gonna be okay because the following week, even if you're getting a little bit lost this next week, None of it had to do with what class do you import to make a Django template, right? I mean, I, I do that like in a recorded lecture, but I'm finding the same place, same time stuff, the synchronous stuff, the high value stuff. And the thing, the reason I think I'm not going to be able to do it in the future is that lasts about 45 minutes per week. I don't, I don't have two or three hours of coaching mm -hmm. per week. I have 45 minutes of coaching and then two to three hours of recorded lectures. I'm, I'm curious if there's things that sort of techniques that you yourself have adopted during COVID that are, that are going to change how you teach after COVID. Well, and see, that's where I'm the, the wrong person to ask because I switched to online about 20 years ago because the classroom was a strange, frustrating place for me. You know, I've always taught gen ed type classes where there's this huge range of students in the class, these people who are totally eager, totally ready to go, bookworms like me, and students who are just in there because it's a required class, but they're engineering majors or business majors or, or, or some other kind of major that would not normally bring them to my classes. And so for me, I've, I've taught asynchronously all this time. And, and I understand for the people who feel like, you know, synchronous is where you really connect with your students and that's what makes it precious and valuable. I would say any way that you connect with your students is precious and valuable. And there are all kinds of ways to connect with your students that are not about face-to-face -face in the classroom. And I think all along there have been students for whom the classroom is a hard place to get to, right? Either because they have, you know, work conflicts or family conflicts or who knows what's going on in their lives. And now with the COVID, everybody's got a reason why it's hard to, to come to campus. But I hope in the future we'll think about all the things we learned trying to do both synchronous and valuable asynchronous stuff to realize that when we offer students asynchronous education, we are not selling them the, the short end of the stick, that asynchronous learning can be just as powerful, just as connected, just as personal as synchronous learning. And so if everybody hasn't learned that yet in COVID, I hope that they will before this is all over. So that leads into sort of another question, and that is, what does your leadership, your deans and your colleagues and chairs and your colleagues think of your 
teaching, right? Do you, do, are you sort of like sneaking around doing this cool stuff or are they like, oh, she's great. We love her. Or is it somewhere in between, right? How supportive are, are they of ungrading? How supportive are they of full asynchronous and feed, all feedback, no grades? They haven't stopped me, right? So that's great. And it's not like I hide what I do. I mean, plenty of people on campus. Yeah, know. we see you on Twitter all the time. <laughs> exactly. And there are some people, administrators from my campus on Twitter too. But I, I have to say it was it was pretty heartbreaking for me to realize that when we did have to switch to online, the assumption was the best online is synchronous Zoom online with the video conferencing. You know, I'm not going to say it's not the best, I'm not going to say it's the worst, but it was really disappointing to me to see that, you know, we were going to expect students to spend all those classroom hours now as Zoom hours, because that basically was the default at my school was, you know, we had these classes scheduled, the classes were scheduled for this day and this time, so you're going to take advantage of that and you're going to use Zoom. Some people have made it work well, but I've certainly seen so many people complaining about Zoom fatigue and Zoom exhaustion, and this is not like the classroom, and I can't wait till it's over. I wish more people had been encouraged, at least at my school, to take the opportunity to do asynchronous stuff. You know, we've had the LMS for years. It's just sitting there waiting to be used. It's not my favorite asynchronous space, but at least the LMS really does try to support asynchronous learning in all kinds of ways. And it was designed as an educational tool. You know, Zoom was not. Um, and I made my views about that known, you know, at Twitter and anytime I've had a chance to chime in at my school, but I think my school is not alone. You know, my students now think online education means Zoom. And so for the first time ever in all these 20 years at the beginning of the semester, I, I used the word asynchronous talking to my students, which was kind of weird. I'd never really bothered to use that term because it's kind of a weird word. It's not part of your everyday vocabulary, but since they knew my class was online, I had to explain online fully asynchronous, here's how it's going to work. So. so 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 getting back to privacy, you you do a lot of your teaching using public things, meaning it's not all in an LMS. It's not all hidden behind a login. That's one of the advantages of an LMS is that, I mean, frankly, I think the biggest original advantage of LMS is we could Xerox stuff or scan stuff that was illegal and put it in an LMS and not get sued. And that was that, that actually, I think, was the the first purpose of an LMS is to not get sued for all the PDFs we were stealing as teachers. But um, be that as it may, how do you avoid telling students that in order to turn their homework in, they've got to put something up on Blogger or whatever? But that's personal. Their, their identity is personal, identifiable information. How do you, I mean, my daughter, had a class where part of that class was make a make a, a blogger page, make a this page, make a that page. And and she didn't she didn't think that the work she was doing for that class was like for the general public. But then years after she graduated, it was all still there. And it was very sort of silly and childlike. And it was just assignments, right? It wasn't like mm -hmm. She had made a grand blog of her own philosophy. She had been told to write a blog post that's got three paragraphs and turn it in. And now she's got this stuff. Now she's since taken it down because she's wanted, she wants to be a grown up now, right? Mm -hmm. And she doesn't want to be judged by that, that one assignment, which is kind of people might not want a public facing self. You know, lots of teachers don't use Twitter, but how do you right. keep it so your students don't end up leaving a trail of personal information when you're using these public systems? Well, and it's it's that public facing self. It's an idea of well, what is yourself and how are you going to fashion that? So from the very first moment that students are setting up their blogs in my classes and it's the first thing they do. I talked to them about using pseudonyms as an option because I think pseudonyms are absolutely fantastic, right? It, you know, the idea of creating a self, a new identity for a specific class is really appealing. It gives you all kinds of freedom that um, that you don't get to have out there in the in the classroom in real life, right? This is online. You can make a new identity. So I'm very explicit about 
not just pseudonyms are an option, but here's how you go in and change your blogger profile. Here's how you might want to name your blog with the URL. Here's what you need to do when you create a post so that the author is maybe just removed from the post. You know, so the nitty gritty of how to, to be pseudonymous in blogger. And then at the end of the semester too, I talked to them about, well, what are you going to do with this stuff? Are you going to leave the blog up or are you going to take it down? Are you going to leave your website up? You're going to take it down. By the time we get to the end of the semester, they see that those websites, the actual projects they've done are super important for my classes. They're really the most important content that I have. And it's really great work. It's not their life philosophy, like you said, but it is kind of their magnum opus for the class. And they have the option of putting their name on it or not. I never use the author's names with uh, the websites, but I do reuse them for the classes. And so they're very aware at the end of the semester that I will be so grateful if they leave it online. Most of them do about, I would say about 95% leave their uh, websites online, which is great. And then the blogs, they know I don't reuse them. I don't especially need them to keep them online, but if they want to keep them online, that's fantastic and they should do that. Since I leave that up to them, I don't really know how many of the blogs stay online or not. I do occasionally see a blog come back to life because I'm subscribed to them. So sometimes I'll take that exact same blog they'd use for my class and use it for another class, which is fascinating, or use it for study abroad or something like that. But I don't have like extensive data about it because those blogs are kind of like their notebooks. And so, yeah, you can throw your notebook in the trash at the end of the semester, but don't, don't throw your, your project away. Something we're doing new this year is I'm going to try making a class anthology that we publish together as a class that we do as a press book. So that's a new phase of, of project lastingness for me. And when I set up the form for them to turn in their submissions to that anthology, I made sure to just like, what is the byline you want here? You know, do you want your name to go on this? Do you want it to just be your initials? Do you want to have it say anonymous? Do you want to use a pseudonym? And that's up to you. And I really need them to think about that because this is a book that will be actually printed, right? We're going to use Amazon, uh, uh, direct publishing so that they can get an actual hard copy, like, you know, to give to your grandma for Christmas or something, right? It's nice to have a book that you've got a story in, but that's the first time I've done something that's actually in print. And that becomes another occasion to talk about, well, do you want me to, to put your name on there or just your initial or what do you want me to do? So after this semester, I'll be able to report back how many of them wanted their actual names on their submissions. So so that, that strategy reminds me of something that uh, a high school teacher in Italy that will remain nameless was using a system to one of, that has one of my Python classes in it, and the system did not allow pseudonyms. Mm. And, and the teacher did not want to reveal the names of the students. So he had the students all register under different fake names, but their, all their last names were Zuckerberg. <laughs> Well, I can tell my pseudonym story. I was a student at UC Berkeley back in the day where they limited the number of units you could have. If you got to, I think it was like 140 credits or something, they booted you out. You could not enroll again. And I wanted to take these summer school classes and I couldn't afford to have the units on my transcript. So I enrolled under this fake name that I made up from a Russian soft porn novel from the <laughs> Uh, the, the early 20th century. So that was great. That was my first adventure in pseudonyms and that had nothing to do with life online. It was my attempt to get my education and not be over credited at my school. Well, we got a, we got a couple of minutes left. I've, I've done most of the asking. Uh, do you have any questions to, or to ask me as we wrap up? Well, I, I've learned so much from my students' patience and, and just Good heartedness during this whole COVID thing. Have you learned something from your students that surprised you during this whole business? Um, I, yes, I, I, I have. I've, I've always taught very much like you. I don't get too worried about cheating. I, I, I see the best in students, right? I, I, I see, I see when students are tired and they fall asleep in class, I don't see that as like hating me or disrespecting me. I don't expect them uh, to stand at attention. I expect them to make choices. You mentioned um, students, some students come in all fired up and they're, this is gonna be the best class ever. And other students come in with, uh, with the need to uh, just get through it and take care of themselves. And so, so I would say that the, the thing that makes me happiest 
in uh, how COVID is turning out is that students are finding ways to take care of themselves, right? They're finding ways to get through, to express their needs, to have things go wrong and recover from it um, in, in the ways that they always have. And so it's, it, it, you know, it's, it, it felt to me like it might be the whole thing has this very sharp edge that when something goes wrong, it goes wrong really badly. And so I, I think that the students sort of still feel like someone cares about them and they trust the system. Um, I don't see a drop off. I don't see an increase in cheating, perhaps even a decrease in cheating, right? Um, partly because it's harder to find somebody. If you're just like sitting in a room, it's easier to sort of look over somebody's shoulder. So that, that, that to me is uh, my positive uh, COVID story is that uh, is we're doing surprisingly well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep, me too. And that's been great because honestly, I didn't know what to expect from the semester, but they have just been ready to work and write and share and connect just like usual. It's been it's been good. Well, I think both you and I have a career, even though we're coming at it from a little bit different directions in that we were interested in online, we're interested in sort of scalability, we're interested in student centered learning. Um, and the COVID just gave us, I think, both of us, the right to experiment a little bit. Mm hmm. Right. And so you can try more things. And if they go wrong, you say, mm, oh, COVID. Right. And so you can maybe do an experiment that you didn't feel like you should do. So so we should probably wrap up. We got about five minutes. There'll be some time for questions. It's my understanding that, uh, Laura, you won't be able to be with us for the questions. And so I'll field the questions uh, best I can. But I'll read the ungrading book. Um, I'll, I'll read through your ungrading chapter before uh, before we show this video. So any yeah. last thoughts? Well, I'll send you a link and thanks for the chance to contribute to this. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Laura, for being part of the Sakai Virtual Conference 2020. Cheers. So, um, so we have about two minutes left. Um, Laura's not here because she's at the dentist. She would, she told me this morning that uh, she would much rather be here than be at the dentist. She apparently doesn't like the dentist. Um, and so uh, you'll be able to see it. And my suggestion in the um, chat was if, um, can I start my video? Yeah, if you want to restart the video, you. No, 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 no. My my camera. You've got me oh, like. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. is it blocked? That's sure, weird. You you got me blocked. Let's see here. I can't believe I could share my screen, but I couldn't show show the. Yeah, video. that's strange. There's something I gotta turn on. Hang on. Okay, well I'll just talk. Um, there we go. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. You should have permission now. Yeah, so now I, I did a quick change into my conference t-shirt from my other <laughs> thing uh, with conference coffee cup. I just have like a whole staff here to help me change clothes really quick in 30 seconds. Um, so I think the best way to, um, uh, to ask questions is probably don't do them all right now in the next 30 seconds. But if you say hashtag Sakai Comp 2020 and at online course later, say, hey, at online course lady, I saw your great talk at the hashtag Sakai Comp 2020, and I have a question. What would you do? Blah, 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 which means that. Um, <laughs> so that's my suggestion. Dr. Chuck, what happened to my beard? I, I took my beard off in solidarity of the president elect of the United States, but once elected, I decided to put my beard back on. But probably shouldn't have recorded that. So, okay. Um, it is exactly right on time, according to my uh, thing. So I think we should uh, end on time, Wilma. I will hand it back to you, and then you can uh, wrap us up. All right, great. Well, thank you for a, a wonderful and thought-provoking um, presentation. It was really um, 
some great ideas there and a lot of a great activity in the chat. Um, the chat will be saved and so I'll post that along with the video when we do get the video and everything um, posted to YouTube. And um, as, as Chuck mentioned, if you have follow up questions, please, um, you know, put them in Twitter um, or you can post things in the, the forum in the Sakai site as well. There's a discussion area there if you want to discuss with folks that are in the site today. Um, so all of those places are great to um, to post follow up questions. And um, right now we're coming up on a lunch break. So we have a half an hour for lunch. Um, there's nothing going on during the lunch. We're not trying to do karaoke or anything this year. I figured people could use a little bit of a break from Zoom for the day. So um, so we have a half hour and then at 1230 the lightning talks. That's going to be a really exciting session. We've got a lot of great lightning talks um, lined up. So we'll be doing those and then go right into the LAMP webinar on um, social engagement in the age of social distance. So and we've got an exciting lineup for the afternoon and we hope to see you back at 1230. Have a great lunch.